We're going to run through um, ADX, uh, Azure Data Explorer, um, just have a quick talk around what it is, what it was, where it came from, how it's been built, and then we'll dive into uh, some actual uh, demo of, uh, of the product, have a little look around processing some um, smallish data by, by modern standards, and uh, then we'll have a dig underneath the covers as well and see what uh, we can look inside the actual cluster we're running here. What is ADX? So uh, the, the product team um, have got some, some really nice uh, um, sort of collateral marketing around this. And the thing that jumped out to me was it's a big data analytics cloud platform optimized for interactive ad hoc queries. The, the key things there, the interactive ad hoc nature of it. So unlike a lot of database systems you know, where you have to design a data model, set up your indexing, petitioning, whatever, 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 um, to get any level of performance out of it. And you're probably aware of a lot of the workloads that you're going to be running. If not, you'll be tuning queries uh, a lot of the time. This one is really different in that um, it's designed for uh, answering questions as opposed to knowing what you're going to ask of it. It's a different way there. Uh, it's a big data platform, so it's append only. Um, it's catering, uh, catering for high volume, uh, high variance, and high velocity data. Uh, it's relational, so um, it has the usual filters, aggregates, joins, all that kind of good stuff. Um, it's fully managed, so cloud platform there. Um, purposely built, I'm not sure purposefully is actually a word, so I changed it to purposely, but there we are. I'm not a, a grammatarian. Um, and as I mentioned, ad hoc queries at the bottom there to explore data. So it's an exploratory platform. So let's just dive into the architecture, give you an overview of what it is, um, and just a little bit under the covers and how it all fits together. So ADX has uh, the uh, a typical kind of um, data cluster uh, architecture. So there's a data management node and a, a whole bunch of execution engines sitting on top of storage in the center there. Um, storage is tiered, so we have uh, obviously the in-memory caching, local SSD caching, and below that uh, storage out into um, large cloud storage, so give you basically infinite storage, right? Um, on the left-hand side there, uh, the source is where we can pull data from, so uh, we can integrate with Spark, with Data Factory, so I think someone mentioned that earlier, um, through IoT Event Hub and Event Grid for streaming data. And then there are open source and uh, application APIs as well. So plugins for Kafka, um, apps can connect via you know, C Sharp, Python, those kinds of APIs on the left-hand side there. It can also integrate straight down into um, cloud storage as well. So it can pull from Blob Store, ADLS, that kind of thing. Um, and at, at the very end of the demo, I'll show you uh, uh, an integration there from, um, let's not jump too far ahead, all right? I'll get the game away. On the right hand side, uh, how we can actually uh, query the data or get to the data. Again, apps um, can go in via an API. It supports TDS, so um, a subset is for SQL, so an ODBC connection kind of thing. Um, Power BI integrations. It has its own uh, web UI, which we'll be looking at in a moment, uh, which supports both interactive querying and uh, uh, some dashboarding as well. So you can build little dashboards and charts and things. Um, Flow logic apps can talk into there as well. Um, uh, and then in the OSS world, in the open source land, uh, integrates into Grafana, so stream data to Grafana, and there's a Spark integration as well. Not shown on there is it can also do um, constant uh, or continuous data extracts or dex data exports. So you can stream your data through, you can do some um, a manipulation of it, you can answer your questions and things there as well. But you can also set it up to actually export data continuously into um, cloud storage, um, which is pretty cool. At the very top, managed by um, applications with the ARM templates, uh, the Azure portal, and um, parts of, in the same way that in, in SQL Server, you can you know, query all of the sys tables. There's, there's um, uh, management parts of uh, the query interface as well as you can get underneath the covers and see exactly what the cluster's doing there. So that's the overall architecture of it. Um, as I said, stream and batch there. Today we're looking at batch ingestion. Um, I haven't set a demo up for stream, uh, but uh, there are some of those available out on GitHub as well. If you want to have a play with them, uh, you can download um, the, uh, uh, the, the actual whole lab and work your way through on the streaming side as well. So please jump in if you want me to stop at any point as well. So ingestion, how we get data in. 
um, batch, as I mentioned, sources, uh, Azure storage, event grid, data factory, uh, formats, uh, CSV, so tab separated, uh, pipe separated, um, so TSV, PSV. Um, supports JSON, ingestion, Parquet, Avro, Orc. It will read W3C logs, so you can give it your web uh, server logs, and it'll ingest those quite happily. Um, those files can also be compressed, so Parquet files are typically snappy compressed. It's obviously all supported there. Um, one of the nice things as well is that you can um, individually compress uh, CSVs or JSON files, and it will automatically decompress and ingest those. And you can also give it a multi-file zip archive. So you can put a whole bunch of CSVs inside a zip file and ingest that, and it will pull it apart and bring each CSV file in there. That's kind of cool. Um, it supports mapping from your source uh, columns and types into destination columns and types. You can explicitly map those, or you can leave the system to uh, apply default mappings. And it has an ingestion batching policy, which is the way that we control how we do the ingestion. Um, so we can say, okay, I want to batch by time. So every five minutes, if you haven't done an ingestion, kick off an ingestion or every 30 seconds that way. We can control by size. So if I've landed 200 megs of data in a, in a blob, ingest at that point. Um, or we can do by file count. So for every 200 files, ingest. And whichever one of those ticks first is how the ingestion process kicks off there. Defaults are shown there, five minutes of kicking out a thousand files. Streaming side, um, sources as I mentioned before, is Event Hub, IoT Hub. Um, you can write custom streaming apps, so you can drop into C Sharp or Python and stream data through that way. And it has a, a, a connector for Kafka as well. Um, the Kafka connector is micro batch, so I think it's, it's very, very small, sort of 10 sort of sub second batch um, that it uses to upload there. Um, so it's not actually streamed, but Event Hub and IoT Hub is streamed through. In the same way um, that there is a, a batch policy, you can set a stream policy to help it uh, with uh, just it's really sort of just um, uh, sort of give it some hints on the, the volume uh, of the data that's coming through and then um, uh, around um, how it can manage those streams um, to, uh, what's the word, maximize the efficiency of ingestion, I guess. It's getting late in the afternoon here. It's probably as late for you guys, but uh, I needed my three o'clock coffee. <clears throat> Query. Um, so it has its own um, query language called Custo Query Language. Custo is the uh, the code word, code name for the product internally in Microsoft a few years back when it was being built. Um, the uh, interestingly, Custo is uh, derived from uh, Jacques Custo. So if any of us are in there, I'm not going to give away my age, but anyway, if any of you remember watching the uh, Undersea World of the Undersea Adventures of Jacques Custo as a kid, yeah, that's that's where. That the name came from, and you'll see little sprinklings of diving and exploring oceans of data throughout the products, um, splash screens and things like that. So there's some little Easter eggs around um, diving into the, the oceans of data kind of thing there, and that's reflected back in the name. Um, and a subset of T-SQL as well, which is really great because if you grew up writing SQL like I did, and you can go, hey, I can solve this without even thinking about it, but what's the KQL uh, syntax for this? It will help you out there, and I'll show you that in the demo. As I mentioned, the analytics um, side of it, typical uh, relational uh, language. So we can do filtering, joining, aggregation, that kind of thing. Whole bunch of functions, um, probably more than I will ever be able to recall off the top of my head um, around time series. So taking, uh, normalizing, uh, and uh, processing uh, that data into a regular series of data. Um, there's uh, some basic machine learning in there as well. Uh, it has geospatial support. And as I said, a whole bunch of functions in there. You can embed Python code and R code and run that across your cluster as well in sandboxed pieces of, uh, of compute. Um, it's really, it's a, it's a vast um, array of abilities to interact with your data in there. But again, the, the, the whole thing of this is around that, uh, that interactive exploratory nature so that you can quickly dive through your data and have a look in there and, and get your insights quite quickly without having to worry too much around how the data is uh, laid out on disk and partitions and things. Um, APIs SDK we mentioned. So as I said, uh, MSTDS, uh, so there's a subset there. So it supports link server into SQL, uh, ODBC, JDBC, all that kind of good stuff there. It is a subset of SQL though. Um, there's REST endpoints for it, uh, Python SDKs, .NET, PowerShell. And a whole bunch of other languages there are, are Java, Node, Go. Um, so different ways you can actually write applications to interact with the cluster as well. Today, we're just going to be looking at uh, KQL though. 
Finally, the integrations, as mentioned, uh, ADF, uh, Synapse workspaces. You can link this into Synapse via, via a link server. Um, it will, uh, there's a, a default, uh, sorry, uh, an out of the box connector for uh, Power BI now, which is really nice. You can do uh, push down of, of parameters into ADX. So you're actually not offloading all the data processing into Power BI, which is nice with a big data cluster always. Um, data sharing, you can set up uh, just Azure data share, but you can also have uh, follower clusters. So you can set up a cluster as a, a lead and uh, then uh, expose that data to follower clusters that can then query across those. That's kind of nice. Uh, DevOps integrations uh, for uh, deploying. Um, and as I mentioned, Grafana as well. Uh, there's a, a, another lab on GitHub if you want to have a play around with Grafana to spin up Grafana in a, a container, connect that into ADX and, and have a play around with that piece. And there's a Spark connector as well there. Finally, tooling, or actually very close to finally uh, tooling. So we'll be playing with the web UI today. Um, some of you may have used uh, Azure Data Studio, which is, I, I kind of like that, uh, especially for the, the notebook experience, the workbook experience that's in there. Um, there's a couple of extensions, the KQL Magic and the Custo extension in there. So you can uh, bring up your, your Python book um, and embed your KQL straight in there. So that gives you a nice, um, a nice sort of experience there. There's a, a thicker client, a little bit like um, SQL Server Management Studio called uh, Custo Explorer. And that gives you some, some tools that aren't available in the web UI. So uh, if you're looking at things like um, what in SQL Server land will be called, uh, yeah, uh, you're looking at your query plans, you can do that kind of digging into how the query is being executed and what those plans look like in that tool. Um, and uh, as well as some uh, different visualizations and things like that. So that's a, a nicer experience for the, the sort of uh, power user. And light ingest is a, a really nice little command line tool that uh, you can set up batch ingestions quite quickly. So you can say, hey, take those thousand blobs over there and ingest them into the cluster here uh, from the command line um, and, and let it uh, fire those jobs off for you. So light ingest is quite a nice, nice way of, of bulk in, importing um, data. So that was a really, really quick whistle-stop tour of the uh, of ADX as a product. I don't want us to spend too much time going through the brochure where I spend a little bit more time diving into the demo. So in um, a, a good tradition of, uh, of data demos, I'm going to be using a data set. You've probably never even heard of it, right? The New York Taxi data set is some data set that's happened quite a lot. Uh, so we're going to be having a look at that. Um, it's uh, one and a half billion records, about 500 gigs uncompressed. So it's not, not massive, but uh, it's a nice chunky data set to play with. Um, it's ingested from 1500 blobs, uh, they were gzip CSVs, uh, million rows per file, which is a kind of recommendation for, for pulling those in. Um, uh, it's available on the container there, and this is where we go from. The, the cluster I'll be using is just a simple two node cluster, they're D14 um, machines. Uh, compute machines, so that's those are 16 uh, vCPUs, uh, just over 100 gigs of RAM in each, and uh, 800 gigabyte um, SSD. Um, so it's not a, a big cluster by any means. Um, some of the ADX installs that, that we've seen are, are going up to sort of petabyte scale with, with dozens and dozens of nodes. Um, so this is a little baby cluster. Um, so with that, well, well, let me just pause. Um, so Can you hear me? Yeah, go, go. Oh, sorry, mate. Uh, there's a question uh, that came up in chat by Steve. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it reads, if I had 60 different JSON files, which mm -hmm. all need to be flattened into multiple extracts for loading into relational tables, uh, example, sign up, sign up DB, is this something I could use ADX to process these different JSONs when they arrive on irregular frequency? So you'd, you'd, you'd want to take your JSON files, process them in ADX, and then export them back into Synapse? I guess. That's correct, yes. Yeah, probably not. I probably wouldn't okay. do it that way. You, you could, you totally could. I wasn't planning it, but I was just look, reading, thinking about, well, oh, that could work. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I definitely could. Um, there's a, a, a column type in ADX, a dynamic column, where you can basically just... just to the end of this. So you, know. so you can just dump whatever you like in there. So you can put JSON straight into there, and then you can process that using the, the input um, JSON processing. Or you can take your files and ingest them straight into tables if they map relatively easily. So there's different ways of doing that and then extract it straight out. Yeah, you, you could, um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure if you should though, um, but uh, yes. So I don't have the chat window open, obviously I've got the presentation view going, so sorry for missing that. 
All right, let's bring up the demo. You should now see my webs. Uh, my uh, whoops, wrong window. What are you doing, Lisa? There we go. So you should be seeing my data explorer window now. Yep. Yeah? Yep, me, you good. can see that. Awesome. Yep, all right. All, all right. So this is the Data Explorer uh, user interface here. Um, looks like a very typical, you know, query over here, table down here, uh, objects over on the side here. Um, so all we're going to do is quickly run through my my database of uh, my New York Taxi database here. Um, I've also got one of our demo um, data sample sets loaded. If you work your way through the ADX tutorials that are on um, uh, in the product. Uh, documentation. There's a, a storm events uh, sort of case there around um, cyclones and hurricanes and things like that in the US. So there's another one there. And then obviously everyone has to have a test database, don't they? So very familiar. First thing I'll do is just bring up and show you what the databases are, which we're already on the screen because I just ran out to make sure I had a connection. So, you know, we could just say, hey, these are the databases here. This is where the persistent storage is. And then a whole bunch of other information around them going off to the right there. We wanted to dive into each one. We can look at the uh, the New York taxi schema, and that will dump the entire schema. But we can uh, just see a uh, table name, column name, types, those kinds of things, which is kind of cool. Uh, these are admin commands, or these dot show commands are the way that uh, an administrator would interact with the cluster. Um, we can dump out the particular table as JSON. So this is the JSON schema here. We expand. This is a nice thing about this user interface. We can expand this down, and it will create um, a uh, like a JSON view of your of your uh, record set there, or your row set there, I should say. So this is a you know, machine readable way uh, format of our, um, our schema. So that's kind of nice to have a look in there. Um, if we were to wanting to write some sort of, sort of complex queries or some ingestion or something like that, and we wanted to actually dump the thing out, that we can just copy and paste it into a query. Then we can export as a a CSL schema, and that gives us just the pure text. So we can copy that out, and that's um, KQL parsable, as it were. So we can paste that into a query, which is kind of nice as well. So a little bit of digging around in there um, to begin with to show you how we can go through from database to table. So some real KQL here now then. So what we've got, the way that KQL works is we take the, the object that we're um, pulling the data from, so the table, um, and then we post it through a series of pipes. Um, so in, in SQL, you know, you have your select at the top, and then you have your from, and then you have your join, and then the other kind of thing. This is a little bit more logical, really. So this one is saying the trips table, one and a half billion rows, um, do a count star by cab type. Yeah. So uh, putting that into CT equal B, select count star from um, the trips. Uh, yeah. So let's quickly run that one. Which is probably just dropped my connection. So we can see there's two cab types in there, but 1.4 billion yellows and 69 million greens. Um, yellow cabs in New York, yellow taxis, the green ones are just the inner borough, uh, relatively new service that came up. Uh, the data set does have Ubers and stuff like that in there as well, but I've dropped that out just for this. We can do um, other kinds of summarizing. So again, trips per year. Um, so this is a little bit like uh, in a, a select statement, you know, when you actually name your select columns back, same thing here. And I'm calling the start of year function on the pickup date time. So this is gonna be grouping by year. And we can run that one. And so we can see the number of trips over each one of these years. Again, these are all real time queries I'm running. So um, you know, most of the data set here is between 2009, 2018. And then there's little bits going to 2084. That sounds a little bit weird. This is a nice thing about exploratory, right? So we can rapidly dig into our data a little bit there. So it gives us an idea of the profile. Um, but if we're in old school SQL land, like I said, some of us grew up with and we wanted to write SQL, we can do that as well. We just prefix the uh, command with a, a double dash and run that. And that would run that SQL on a cluster um, sort of as KQL, if you like. So what's this one doing? This is um, the number of trips uh, per number of passengers. So most of the trips were a single passenger, and then two passengers, four million empty trips. Um, someone said to me, this, that's the amount of uh, 
I've lost luggage that I have to deliver from JFK Airport, and this is why the taxis are empty. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but um, that's how we can put SQL. But if we want to learn KQL, though, we can uh, actually get it to uh, transpose or, or translate the SQL into KQL, which is kind of cool. And we just do that with an explain. So that looks very similar to back in SQL Server land. So if we run that one, that will just dump out a query. Again, we can expand it down and we get it over here in a nice little view. And then we can take that query and we can see, oh, okay, I know how to write it in SQL. This is how I'd write it in KQL, which is kind of handy. And I found this really useful when I was picking up the language. So there are some subtleties there. Now that KQL that it gives you obviously is not going to be fully optimized. So you can tweak it around a little bit. And so I've reduced that query down to this one which again is the same as we were just looking around. This one's giving you two new pieces in here though. So we we're just playing around with summarize. So we we're doing counts. Uh, project is like a select. So I want to summarize the passenger counts, but I only want passenger count column called passenger count and I want the number of trips. I don't want anything else back from there. And then I want you to sort it as well. So projection is your select, sort is your sort, summarize is your aggregation. Quite basic to, to so far. So there's a little bit more of an advanced uh, query. There's a where clause coming to the top there now. So what we're doing instead of on, on normal SQL, you know, you'd have the where clause down the bottom. Um, this one we pipe it through first of all. So this is actually filtering the table here before we start summarizing and projecting at the bottom there. Obviously, the optimizer will change the order around. It's, just, it's smart enough to know when I've put a where clause in the wrong position. But typically, we lay out the queries that way just to make them logical for ourselves. So, um, so this one is uh, date time for 2009 to 2018. Um, because there's so many different ways of writing between and two uh, in KQL, it's double dots. And it has those spaces on either side of it. Um, so that will filter out that date range. And then we can do a summarize. So we're doing count by passenger count um, by year. And then we're binning our distance into one mile bins. So we're creating a whole bunch of one mile slots. And we're going to drop them into there. Now, um, this one's actually not a good query. This is a, probably a bad way of doing it. Um, and um, looking at this line here, which is turning my date time into a string, I'm sure there's some uh, some DBAs and some data uh, developers sitting there going, why are you trying to, why are you converting all your date times into strings and then grouping them on that, right? That's not a good way of doing it. That query there takes about 25 seconds to run, so I'm not going to run it. But a more efficient way of running the same thing would be to, to um, take just parsing off the date time part. Okay, so, you know, we're just grouping on that one column there, and that one takes about two seconds to run. So same way with with um, with uh, SQL Server or with uh, any of your, your sort of um, traditional SQL engines, you can write bad queries in this, right? And it will it will punish you for it. So achieve the same thing, but much quicker. So this one's I think about two and a half seconds. There we go, three seconds. So this one is aggregating by year the passenger count and distance. So most trips in two thousand and nine were one passenger going up to a mile, um, the second ones were naught to one miles, and so on. You can see the, the different level of aggregations being done there across all of the data sets there. And there's like 10,000 rows come back. So that's pretty cool answering that question. Um, but you know, we've only been looking at uh, a tabular data and that's not really nice. I like looking at pictures. So we can also just tell it to render some charts for us. So this one we're going to take um, cabs or journeys with less than five passengers. Um, we're going to calculate the average fare by passenger count. So a nice little bit of aggregation there. And then we're going to um, render that as a column chart. So we can run that one. And there's our chart. So we can see that uh, the, uh, the zero passengers, the lost luggage case, um, $11. Uh, the twos were $14 and so on. And that's kind of a nice way of visualizing it. If you want to drop back to the table, it's right there as well. So I like this way of, uh, of being able to interact quite easily uh, and do some quite basic charting quite quickly. I mentioned um, time series. Um, so it supports time charts as well. This one, uh, what we're going to do is go into bin into seven day bins, so weekly bins. Um, 
based on obviously the pick up date. Uh, we're going to do counts by cab type for 2009-2018, and then we're going to render it as a time chart. So we can see the use in different uh, cabs here. So you can see that overall, these are the, the ranges for our yellow cabs, and then we can see the rise of the green cabs down the bottom here. Um, obviously a lot less because they're only on the inner boroughs and they only started off around sort of late 2013-2014. So obviously this isn't really like time series data as such, it's, it's uh, log data from, from taxi trips, but in the same way you can create a, a proper time series and, and put that through a time chart and, and um, visualize it in the same way. We have here, ah, okay, this one is the next one is kind of nice. So, so far we've just been playing around with a single table and, and Custer is very, very quick, very powerful for those big wide single table um, uh, queries, but you can join as well. So this one, instead of using something like a case statement or an if statement to do uh, lookups of data types into uh, human readable um, nice strings, we're going to create an inline data table. And then we're going to join that table across the cluster. So let's say it's a broadcast join. So broadcast this across the entire node. I've only got two, but if you had 200, it would spread it across all 200. And then we're going to do a join on this inner query down here. So we're going to join trips on pickup date between uh, where the workplace guide date is. Then from there, we're going to summarize by payment type. So our human readable payment types into seven day bins and render a time chart. So pretty much this is saying, just tell us how the change between cash and credit card happened over um, those 10 years uh, on a weekly basis using this join here. You can see the syntax is a, a little bit different than what you'd expect in, uh, in SQL land. So we have left and right, and we're putting the small table on the left-hand side, um, so which is a, a very good rule of thumb uh, that we start with small, we join to big, we don't start with big and join down to small. Um, this is just doing a simple join. Um, there's, uh, it supports uh, inner, outer, full, anti, um, and a whole bunch of other joins I don't think I've ever used as well. Um, so let's run that one. Takes a little bit of time, this one. I think this one's about five seconds. Oh, it's gonna be a little bit longer, six seconds, there we go. Um, so to go across uh, one and a half billion rows, um, categorize them into cash or credit card, and then binning them on seven days um, to trace out the rise in credit card payments and the fall in cash payments. Whoops, there. So we can see that it's expected, right? Same thing we've been doing here. Who carries cash these days? More and more people are spending um, on credit cards and less and less on cash. But that's kind of nice, though. A very, very quick um, summary over that, uh, that data set. So I think that's, it. that's enough sort of digging around in, in data. Um, I'm sure you've all played with the New York taxi data a lot more, and there's uh, quite some good examples that I've got in the back of the slide deck that I can send, that I'll send around afterwards with further examples um, using ADX to, uh, to, to dig down further into um, that data set. But I wanted to show you some of the internals as well that you can do. Um, so, Diagnostics, you can bring back cluster diagnostics. So this one is um, a nice little JSON document here. Actually, it's a huge JSON document of pretty much everything you ever wanted to know about the internal state of your, your cluster, um, plus a whole bunch of other uh, metrics around what it's up to on the inside. So um, how it's merging uh, data extents across the cluster. Um, so shards, they automatically merge shards to, to bring them into um, the standardized or normalized form, if you like. Um, the uh, the health of the cluster, um, what the number of imports and exports are in um, uh, in progress, how much data is living in the warm cache, how much is in the cold, and that kind of thing is all in there. We could dive into the cluster and we can parse this environment description that we've got here into a bunch of properties, and then we can just pull out some properties that we're interested in just using normal path-like statements. So this one here is going to show us the name of my two compute engines and the, the region that they're in, they're in Australia East. And obviously parsing JSON is not limited to, to yeah, this kind of diagnostic stuff. You can use that in your normal queries as well. So that goes back to the comment earlier. You can dump JSON into a single column, a dynamic column, 
and then parse it as you go if you need to actually get into that a little bit later. And you can do things like contains and ends and where's on that JSON as well. So it's kind of nice. Obviously, it's much, much quicker if you normalize it on the way in and put it in a column, but it is available to you there as well. We can look at what's been up to in the cluster. So a bit of auditing for the DBA kind of people around um, and what the cluster's been doing. So way back, when was this? So it's been doing a little bit of extent management there. So it's dropped a few extents. Um, and you can see you know, it's been looking at some temporal storage, looking at the tables, and it goes all the way through. So you can audit what the actual uh, operations are being performed on there. Um, we can look at the commands and queries. So we can say, hey, show me all the commands that have been run on the cluster and show me the data ingestions. So these are um, the uh, blob uh, ingests that I've run. Top one here, ooh, oops, that's got the wrong thing formatted. There we go. So we can see that I ingested into a, a date dimension. There's the command, a whole bunch of things there. That's kind of cool. Uh, we can, again, look through the journals. We can look at the extents, what's in the cluster here. So this is what's in the table, the size of it, how much it is actually stored, how much is compressed. So it took uh, a five gig file, compressed it down to 1.3 gigs. And these are the extents for that particular table. So you can see there's like about 100 and something of them. Um, and the indexes, so every column is indexed by default and they're all stored columnar format. Um, and if we wanted to look at the details of that table, we can pull these back here as well. So we can dig into our data and actually look at the size of it. Um, something that we get asked a fair bit is, so what kind of throughput can you get from there? And you can write some KQL to say, hey, all those ingestions have been running on that big table. Just tell me what my average throughput is. So we're looking at the trips tables details. We're pulling back the size and we're formatting it into gigabytes for the format bytes function. Ring out the total row counts. We're formatting a time span to see uh, how long it took. And then we're just doing a quick calculation on the throughput per second. And that will give me about 187 megabit, uh, megabytes. So I pulled in half a terabyte of data, one and a half billion rows, took 43 minutes and was running it around, yeah, let's call it 200 megabytes a second for uh, yeah, 187. Um, so those are some of the things that you can do with uh, with Custo and how you can dive into it. A little bit of looking at the um, processing of a reasonable chunky size data set, you know, one and a half billion rows, and then how we can actually look and see how the cluster's working underneath there. I'll just pause very quickly for any questions. So I'll dive through that quite quickly this time. Um, I, again, I don't have the chat open, so someone could yes, read out Mark anything. Come through in the chat, Liesl, so that's an easy one to cover off. Hmm. But if anyone does have a question they'd like to ask, now is a great time. I hear typing. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear someone typing. And if there is a really good question, I may or may not have a prize to give away for that tonight as well, just to incentivize some questions from the audience tonight. I guess I have a question, Liesl. And is, uh -huh. is, is, is there anything that you found that it's not good at so far? Because from an exploratory point of view. Yeah, like it's it's not a data warehouse. All right. So if you're trying to build facts and dimensions and and, uh, and building that into it and then uh, you know running your typical uh, summation across a fact table joining to a bunch of dimensional tables, it can do it. I mean it definitely can, but it's not that's not what it's designed for. Um, it's uh, it can be tricky sometimes pulling in data from different formats. So CSV is like super fast to ingest. GZIP CSV is super fast. But if you're going into something a little bit more obscure like Avro or Orc or something like that, then um, that can uh, be a little bit slower. Um, and it's very good in that um, sort of semi-structured log file kind of uh, data, which is where it's come from, and these flat tables as well. So uh, when you ingest, it's a good idea to to shape the data into um, you know, one or two uh, tables that you're going to be joining across as opposed to trying to create a whole relational model there. Um, so yeah, that's that. It's it's not great if you're trying to query out a large amount of data. So there's a, some defaults on the cluster of uh, half a million rows and uh, I think it's 600 megs. Uh, there's a, there's a, a result set size as well. So if you're trying to do a, a data export 
um, from uh, without doing export on the cluster, if you're trying to do it from a client, so the client sucks down all the data and saves it locally, then you're going to get into problems that way. But um, that's the way around that is easy. It's just to export using the cluster as opposed to export using the client. Um, and why you'd want to pull back half a million rows to, to a client, I don't know. You'd put, this is why you would want to aggregate it actually on the cluster. So it just takes a little bit of change of mindset of what you're doing there. Um, so yeah. I guess I saw something else. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about scaling. Um, given that I've got zero experience with this so far, and it yep. talks about rapid scale up and scale. Like, is it aggressive in its scale up and scale down? So um, there's a bunch of different ways you can put scaling on, on it. Um, you can say, um, okay, provision me a two node, three node, four node cluster. That's all I want. Leave it alone. Static scaling. Okay. Um, you can get it to dynamic scale up. Um, and I think I just saw in preview, um, they've applied uh, a next level of um, intelligence scaling around that. So it will actually look at your workloads and say, hey, look, every Monday morning, you seem to run very big jobs. So I'm going to preemptively scale this up uh, now. So it's ready for you. And then I also noticed that that finishes by 10 o'clock in the morning. So I'll actually scale it back down at 10 o'clock, regardless of what the load's going, because I can see your usage patterns. So it does have that, that um, flex itself. Um, yeah, it, it's this so the standard three ways of scaling in there. Um, the only thing that, that's in there that may be a limitation is auto shutdown. Um, so the cluster does could shrink down, but it won't shut itself down automatically. But you could automate that with sort of a, you know, a power automate scripts and those kinds of things um, to close it off if you want to only have it up on a, you know, a Monday or a Tuesday or whatever. So, yeah, three, three main ways of scaling. I think uh, Marlene also has a question. Marlene, you yeah. can feel free to ask yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a question. My question is regarding the costs. So if you could, uh, what are the costs um, for this Azure Data Explorer, if you can talk about that? Pretty much, it boils down to the VM cost plus storage, um, plus the, the sort of management overhead on top of that. Um, there is a cost calculator uh, in the um, on, on the product page. Uh, so if you go to, the Azure product page to find out, uh, a data explorer. You can look in there, and you can do things that like it will work. The the uh, the cost calculator will recommend cluster sizes for you as well. So you can say, hey, I'm ingesting 10 terabytes a day, um, and my query load looks like this, and I think it's going to be you know, heavy compute as opposed to heavy storage. And it will come back and say, okay, we recommend this size VM, and this is what your cost will look like. Um, so that one's really it depends on what you deploy. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much the um, the tied to the size of your VMs and the size of your storage plus the um, the small amount of overhead cost as well. Um, so this one, this is a two D four teams. I think I'm not too sure what the uh, the per hour cost of a D four team would be. Yeah. Someone else on the call know what those are off the top of my head. Um, so it's two times one of those plus. Uh, uh, a terabyte of my data that I've got stored, or 500 gigs of my data that I've got stored. Um, so it's, it's actually a, a very reasonable sort of platform. No more? I think that's all for now. All right, I have one <laughs> last last cool demo to show you then. Awesome. This is my favorite piece. So let me just show you. In my demo database, I have only one single table, right? That dim data table that I've been playing around with. This, I love this. So this is pulling in external data. So here's my, my table uh, there. It's taking it from the data.gov.au website. So it's grabbing a CSV. Uh, can anyone work out what the data set might be? Yeah. So this is ingesting public data from a website. It's not actually putting it into a table at all. It's just bringing it into memory. It's a CSV format, ignore the first record because it's got column headers on it. And then we're going to project through there the longitude, latitude. We're going to do some string um, manipulation here to make up a little uh, line of text. And we're going to render it as a scatter chart. Um, so in what have I got there? Five, six lines of code. Um, I can pull in, in about two seconds, um, 20,000 records of all of the locations of public loos around Australia, Ta -da, uh, and pull them on a map. Um, 
So this is one of the nice things about the exploratory nature of, of ADX. You don't even need to ingest the data. You can just point it at a, a, an accessible web, um, website or blob store, um, bring those in and then map them out. So who's in Canberra? Canberra's around here somewhere, isn't it? My geography is terrible. Um, yeah, that'll be that big cluster. Is that right? Oh, no, not that big cluster. <laughs> no, a little bit to north and east, east. There you go, that big cluster. Oh, yeah, okay, over here somewhere. Stop open. Uh, don't want to talk about the East Coast. Let's go over here. This <laughs> <laughs> so if you're ever stuck on another ball, you know where to go. Right? It's, a, it's a funny example, but it's just showing you the way that you can, you don't even need to ingest the data and it's still super fast. You have two seconds to download that data, parse it into CSVs, run a query on it, spit out the scatter chart and run, then throw it back onto my uh, my PC here over in Perth. is is pretty super cool. So yeah, that's um, pretty much um, where I wanted to finish with the code. The very end here. Um, what do you reckon the radius is of one of those circles? It's oh, big. 30 square kilometers. <laughs> yeah, look, it's not a mapping. It's not a GIS tool at all, right? This is a, a scatter plot. So I mean, if you and zoom it in. It does vary with your zoom as well. It does vary with the zoom, yes. It does have geo functions built in, though. So if you want to do things like, you know, intersects closest to all of that kind of stuff in your querying, you can do that. Um, and I know there's some roadmapy stuff around actually improving the, the map output of it. I'm being a little more serious there, but um, yeah, it's just a nice, uh, nice sort of example. Have you actually specified that as a data type? Sorry, before you move on. Yeah, yeah. So was that a geo data type? I like to see strings. No, no, or no. The, it, CS, the CSV is simply this. So it's a latitude and longitude and uh, the details. So oh, it's sorry. not a geo JSON. It's not a shape file or anything like that. It's just that long. Sorry, when you when you define the temporary table, I guess this is my question. Okay. Did you? Yep. Did you define no, no, uh, Latin no. long as? They're oh, just reals. Cool. Yep. Yeah, cool. So that's the straight copy of that CSV file. So if you go off to the the data um, Gava Youth um, website, you can download that data file and you can get exactly as that is. So yeah, it's just lat longs and um, and then the string that I formatted up there. It's pretty cool. Um, so some just finally just wrapping up on the, the slide where bit. Um, at the very end, there's some resources there for you. I'll PDF this and send it out and then I think you, know, you, you can um, have a look through. So the docs for it, the intro, uh, there's a couple of learning modules on the learning site there to have a, a look through there. The overall architecture, I, I dived into um, the internal architecture, but there are some architecture patterns of how you glue this into a data platform and where it best sits so alongside things like Synapse or if you're using um, Databricks or whatever along in your overall landscape, how it fits into there. Tech community um, and the labs that I mentioned as well, the hands-on labs that you can play with. Um, and then there's some references here. So uh, ingesting and analyzing the New York taxi rides, far more comprehensive than I've been through now, um, and that's something you can work through there. And Underneath the hood, what happens when a custom code is executed? So, looking at how you can look at the queries, um, how the data is actually um, sharded across the clusters, how the table and indexes sit together. As I mentioned, every column is indexed and they're all column stores. Uh, the partitioning is done uh, by ingestion date time by default. Um, so, it's partitioned around the, the cluster that way. Um, so, that's a really nice article to have a look further down inside the, uh, the actual um, product. So there we are.